Hey, as we were as uh, we were singing that last song, I want you to understand a commitment we have at Stonebridge, and that commitment is to sing from the Word of God, sing lyrics that are derived directly from His Word. And in this last song we're singing, "On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand," all other ground is sinking sand. It, it comes from the tail end of the Sermon on the Mount, and I just want to read it over us. We'll pray and we'll dive into today's passage. But this is what Christ is saying. He's saying. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them may be compared to a wise man who has built his house upon the rock and the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and burst against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded upon the rock. This is the wealth in the lyrics that we're singing this morning that so often we sing because we know the melody but we miss the depth theologically in these songs. As we, as we are about to start, would you pray with with me. Father God, we are grateful to be in your church gathered together as believers, Lord. Under your headship, Father God, because of the work of your Son and because of the indwelling of the Spirit in our lives, we can call on you as Father, and we are grateful towards that end. Father, even as we gather together as fellow believers, we get to sing praises to you, truths from your scripture, Father God, about you. Thankful even for the encouragement that can be derived from your scripture, for in it is found all we need for a life of righteousness. And even this morning, Father God, as we unpack your word, may your spirit guide us through it. Lord, we know that there is a promise in scripture that your word never returns void, and may this pulpit always be committed to declaring the good news through your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. On April 14th, 1912, there was a boat that was going across the Atlantic called the SS Masaba. It was a merchant ship traveling across the Atlantic, and it noticed shortly after it left some icebergs in the water off the coast of Newfoundland. Many of you may know this story. But at 7.50 p.m., the Masaba's wireless operator sent this message, quote, saw much heavy pack ice and great number large icebergs, also field ice. Weather good, clear. This message was sent to the Titanic. It was received at 9.50 p.m., yet the message never made it to the bridge of the Titanic. We understand how the story ends, the unsinkable ship sank, claiming more than 1,500 lives that day because a warning was not either taken serious or delivered. You know, people hypothesize about why the captain didn't pay attention to these warnings. They, they, they claim that maybe he had pressure to maintain the speed at which he was traveling. Maybe he had an, a, a strong belief that an iceberg could not cripple the Titanic. Maybe he just didn't understand what these warnings were. Regardless of the issue, regardless of the warning, they were not heeded, and more than 1,500 souls were lost that day. How much more the weight of God's warnings that are found in his word? This leaves us with the question, how attentive are we to the warnings found in God's word? Do we take them serious? And do we understand that the warnings that are found in God's word have eternal ramifications? We need to understand that the, the word of God is peppered with warnings, but, but oftentimes we focus on the negativity of warnings. And the reality is that God gives us warnings because of his great love for us. This morning, we're going to turn to the book of Jude, and we're going to look at a warning that is given to the church in Jude. It's a stern warning to contend earnestly for the faith, specifically in a culture that changes like shifting sand. You see, Jude is going to provide us a warning this morning that even ungodly persons, ungodly teachers will infiltrate the church arrogantly and deviantly 
with the purpose of distorting doctrine, theology, leading people astray. Would you open your Bibles, if you haven't already, to the book of Jude? It's the second to the last epistle in the New Testament, right before Revelations. We're going to pick up and work through verses four through seven together. Would you follow along with me as I read? For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving the people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bounds under darkness for the judgment of that great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, they are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. You see, this warning that Jude is providing us in Scripture is not a new warning. Warnings are peppered throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament of false prophets and false teachers that will come in. Jesus, in fact, has multiple warnings in the New Testament. In Matthew 7, Jesus says this right before that passage I just read relating to building your house on the rock. Jesus says this, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous Wolves, church, how will we know them? We will know them by their fruit, Jesus says. In Matthew 24, Jesus says this, See to it that no one misleads you. False Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead you, if possible, even the elect. You see, these warnings are peppered throughout Scripture Paul warns in Acts to the elders in Ephesus, he says, I know after my departure, savage wolves will come in. Paul warns in his Romans letter that false teachers will introduce secret heresies denying the master. Peter warns of the same thing. You see, with these warnings in mind, what Jude does and what I want us to do is be able to identify these terrorists who enter the church primarily as leaders in the church that ultimately teach a false gospel and live lives that are not changed by the gospel. You see, fortunately, God's word within the letter of Jude grants us a clear description of how we as believers can exercise discernment and judgment identifying these terrorists who enter the church. And today we're going to look to understand their character and their morality. I want you to understand as an elder of Stonebridge Bible Church, this is going to be a weighty message But there is no greater joy I have in my life as serving as an elder, and we believe this is the entire counsel of God. And even though there are difficult passages that we need to deal with that are a warning, I would be remiss if I didn't, out of my love for this church, share this warning with you all. You see, we live in a world based on relativism and, and that is not based on truth, but we have God's word, which is his entire counsel, which is the absolute authority and the standard for all we need for righteous living. And so this morning, we're going to dive into Jude's message because it's concise and direct and it dismisses any confusion. In July, the last time I preached when Johnny was out of town, we began a series on Jude, and I walked through three specific things, um, setting up the context for Jude. We talked about the authorship of Jude, the audience of Jude, and then specifically the thesis. And I know many of you are new to Stonebridge even since July, so I want to review a little bit of that context prior to diving in to this specific Passage. So if you would look with me at Jude verses 1 through 3. 1 through 3. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept 
for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. So just, just a quick review on context. The author, we can tell from these first few verses, is Jude. Jude happens to be the brother of James and the half-brother of Jesus Christ. We also knew from our last study, by taking kind of a long walk through the New Testament, we come and understand more than likely Jude and James did not come to saving faith in the fact that their half-brother was the Messiah until after his resurrection. We, we come to understand the audience, and this is imperative. We come to understand the audience because Jude frames them up with three specific words in the first verse of this chapter. He, he refers to them as being called, as being beloved, and as being kept. And if you remember the last time I taught, or maybe you weren't here, this is in Greek language related to a banquet, it's, it's banquet language where you are called or invited to come to the banquet. You are beloved, meaning when you show up, you are welcomed in with open arms and you are kept, meaning once you are in, you are eternally secure. And so we understand that the audience that Jude is referring to are believers. This matters as we start to unpack this passage because Jude is going to outline what ungodly persons look like. And for us to understand what ungodly persons, ungodly false teachers look like, we have to understand what the godly are to look like according to God's word. Lastly, we come to understand the thesis of Jude's writing. As we look at the language, Jude originally was going to write a letter of encouragement purely based upon their, their agreement of salvation, the joy that they have in salvation. But then he felt the urge, the necessity to write a letter appealing to them that they would contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. You see, certain men had snuck into the church and exemplified and taught a false gospel and lived lives not in accordance with the gospel. So this morning, I want to look first at the character of these ungodly persons found within the church. Would you look at verse four with me? For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord. You see, Jude is providing this definition of ungodly persons more than likely or presumably ungodly or false teachers. Last time we understood that these men had snuck into the church. They had crept into the church. They became, they were unnoticed as they came into the church. And one thing we're not going to deal with this morning, but we will deal in the future the next time I fill the pulpit for Johnny, we will understand the judgment of these people. So I want you to be sure that this judgment on these specific people, these specific imposters, these specific characters that we're going to look at, their judgment is sure, and Jude said it's predetermined, but we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on that, but it is predetermined and final, okay? So as we start to understand this, we have to understand that their message is one of cheap grace, the, uh, this word licentiousness gets translated from Greek to licentiousness only in the book of Jude. But in Greek, this word is used 10 times throughout the, the New Testament. Nine of the 10 times, it gets translated as sensuality or sensual. But for some reason in the book of Jude, it gets translated as licentu licentu licentiousness which obviously is not a common word that I use. I used it a lot this week, but prior to this week, I did not use a lot. The, the root of that word is license. So I want you to keep that in mind. The root of that word is license, but nine out of 10 times in the NS, NASB specifically translated into English, it was translated as sensuality or sensual. You see, these ungodly persons within the church live out a gospel of cheap grace, which permits them license sins to enjoy physical, especially sexual pleasure or satisfaction. 
They are consumed by the world and obedient to unrighteousness. Ultimately, they uphold a false gospel of forgiveness without the notion of repentance and turning from sin. They grant this license for immorality. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, grace is free, grace is costly, but grace is not cheap. You see, cheapening grace cheapens the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The posture of these unregenerate leaders in the church is a boastful arrogance standing in the face of God, abusing his word for their own personal self-gratification. They are still and will always be slaves to sin rather than slaves to righteousness. And we know that because their judgment is predetermined. You see, the gospel that Jesus proclaimed was a call to discipleship. And for us to differentiate and understand what a false gospel is, we have to know the real gospel. And so this morning, we're going to take a little bit of a walk to be able to have the discernment and the wisdom to be able to identify these ungodly persons. You see, a call to follow Jesus is a call to submissive obedience, not just a plea to, to, to make a decision or to pray a prayer. Jude is exposing the same problem that we see in Western culture as a generalization. The prevailing view of what constitutes saving faith has become more shallow and has gone, grown, grown broader than ever because faith is not merely just an intellectual exercise. It is a complete life surrendered to Jesus Christ, whereas we become obedient followers of Jesus Christ, this is why in our modern churches, we negate to teach the very teaching of Jesus Christ when he says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must what? Deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. What's interesting as I looked at this book, knowing that Jude's brother is James, I'm the youngest of three boys. I have two brothers, both of whom love the Lord and teach his word. And truthfully, they're both more equipped to be up here than myself. But what's interesting about it is I love when someone meets my brothers, one of the two, and they don't really know that we're brothers, right? And they come to me and they're like, man, I met your brother today. You know how I met your brother? You all have the same mannerisms. You guys speak the same way. You act the same way. And if you're in one of their Bible studies, they will look at you and say, you guys harp on the same things too, <laughs> right? Which ultimately comes from our father as well, right? But it was interesting as I was studying Jude because his brother James, they have a similar message, even though the context of that message is a little bit different. So I want to go to James as a church, flip to James 1, and let's, let's just look at what James communicates specifically about the gospel. And I want to make us a little bit uncomfortable as we read this book, James. You know, there's controversy around the book of James. There were many people that didn't want it to be considered as part of the canon. But, but one thing you need to understand about Stonebridge Bible Church is that we teach the entire word of God and God never contradicts himself. And so what we do as a church is we use scripture to interpret scripture so that we can understand and realize that God never contradicts himself and yet provides us details through different writers through the work of the Holy Spirit. So flip with me, James chapter one, let's look at verse 22. James 1, 22. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man is blessed in what he does. 
does. The reason there's controversy is many people would say Jew, uh, I'm sorry, James is teaching salvation by works. That's why there was controversy on whether this should be included in the canon. Flip to chapter 2 real quick. We're going to pick up in verse 18, chapter 2, verse 18. And like I said, I promise there's a point to this because we have to understand what the true gospel is to understand what the false gospel that Jude is warning us about that will infiltrate the church, chapter 2. Now, the setup in chapter 2, I believe it's verse 14. Paul, uh, I'm sorry, James asks a rhetorical question. He says, what good is it, my brother, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can that faith save him? I want you to jump forward to verse 18. James says this, but someone may well say you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected, and the scripture was fulfilled, which said, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see, both brothers, James and Jude, are challenging the church of the day with the subsequent obedience of faith. One thing I love about both of these brothers, Jude and James, is the fact that they continually point back to Old Testament characters. You know, the author of Hebrews does that. Paul does that numerous times in the book of Romans. Jesus does it. But it's a complete understanding, and we will teach here, that there is a singular storyline in Scripture that is being unfolded, that is woven and throughout, and it's a singular storyline of God's love for us and his intention in redeeming mankind. And so James looks at Abraham as an example, and Jude uses language saying, you know all of these things, but I don't want to assume you know all of these things. So let's review this. Abraham, God comes to him one day, and he says, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. And he says, and through you, the entire world will be blessed. But Abraham doesn't have any children. Abraham decides to take this into his own hands. But eventually, God, with, with, uh, between Abraham and Sarah, provides them a child named Isaac, who would be the one that Abraham would assume God is going to use to make him a great nation. And what happens? God comes to Abraham and says, hey, take that one son that you assume I'm going to bless the world with, and I want you to go sacrifice him to me. And what does Abraham do? Abraham does it. Abraham takes Isaac on the mountain. And we know how the story ends. The Lord provides a ram in the thicket to take the place of Isaac, which parallels the gospel message that we see. But this is what James is saying. James is saying that it was reckoned to him as righteousness because his obedience was the fruit by which he had faith. And you may be sitting here and feeling a little bit uncomfortable, like I'm trying to thread a, a needle, okay? But because we look at the whole counsel of God, this is what Paul says to Titus in chapter 3. Paul says this, But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the the hope of eternal life. You see, Jude and James are not teaching that we are saved by works because elsewhere in scripture it says we're saved by grace through faith alone. So how do we put these things together? Well, Paul does it in the book of Romans and we don't have time to read the entire book of Romans, though I would encourage you to spend some time in the book of Romans, but I want you to follow along with me real quick, just as I rapid fire through these chapters. Romans 1, God is holy and his wrath is revealed from heaven against all mankind because Paul teaches that the consequence for sin is God's wrath. It is death. Romans 2, everyone is without an excuse deserving of God's wrath because a holy God must judge unrighteousness. 
Romans 3, everyone is found guilty and falls short of God's glory or God's holiness, both Jew and Gentile, Paul says. End of Romans 3, Romans 4, God displays Jesus as our replacement, our propitiation is the term he uses in his blood to those who repent and believe those very people are justified righteous because of the righteous life of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. Romans 5 Christ's sacrifice fulfills God's requirement of a spotless lamb as Jesus takes our place, absorbing the wrath of God that is due us on him. Christ's righteousness then becomes imputed to us, and that justification, that declaration, brings us back into a right relationship with God. Did I go fast enough? Okay, that is the gospel message. But here's what's amazing. Romans chapter six, because we need to understand Romans chapter six to understand what these ungodly persons are going to be teaching in the church. Romans chapter six, because of Christ's righteousness and our faith, which by the way is a gift of God, the faith that we have, Paul writes in Ephesians, it is a gift of God. It has nothing to do with us, which means it has nothing to do with works. Paul says, we are no longer slaves to sin, but rather we are freed from sin and we become slaves to righteousness. Romans 6, 17, Paul outlines it and says, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed and having been freed from sin, you have become slaves to righteousness. You see, we are not saved by works, but we are saved by the grace of God by which he gifts us even the faith to believe in him. Thereafter, there is a promise of sanctification, which is a process that the word of God tells us we go through whereby we become more holy. Better yet, after salvation, by which we are imputed Christ's righteousness and declared justified, we are each taken through a process by the work of the Holy Spirit who indwells all believers, making us more like Christ day after day. You see, Christ doesn't just save us. Jesus says at the end of Matthew, I must go because one greater is going to come. The creator of the universe gifts us his Holy Spirit, who also was part, uh, was also the creator of the universe. And that Holy Spirit indwells us. So this slavery is a willingness to present ourselves to God as one alive from the dead and instruments of righteousness to God. That's why Paul in chapter 6 of Romans that I just mentioned, he, he asks this question in Romans 6, 1, and it's not rhetorical. He, he asks this question, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? And Paul answers the question, says, no, may it never be. And you may be sitting here going, what in the world does this have to do with Jude? Because if we do not understand the gospel and we don't understand the work of the Holy Spirit, we cannot understand what a false gospel is. You see, here's the good news. Paul writes in Philippians 2. Just listen. Paul writes in Philippians 2 and gives us some amazing news about our obedience and righteousness. He says, so then in verse 12, my beloved, just as you, just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence now, but now much more in I, my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And you might think, man, that's not the good news. That still sounds like we're kind of saved by works, right, Justin? Well, here's the next verse. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You see, God is the one who works through his Holy Spirit in our lives to produce the fruit that represents the fact that we are truly saved. You see, Paul says this, if you, go back in, if you go back one chapter in Philippians, in verse 6, Paul says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to finish it. He will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Jesus. 
You see, how does this relate back to Jude? Because at the beginning of Jude, in the context of understanding that he is talking to believers, Jude uses those three terms. He says, you're called, you're beloved, and you're kept. And the thing we need to understand is that is completely a work of God, and that is the gospel message. You see, Jesus grants us an invitation to the banquet. And, and he, he, we are beloved because he welcomes us in. And we are kept because of no work of ourselves, but a work of the Holy Spirit through our lives. They produce endurance, which solidifies our guarantee for eternity. So for us to understand what these ungodly people look like, we need to know what godly people look like. Jude puts it this way, the ungodly turn the grace of God into licentiousness and deny Jesus Christ as Lord and Master. Do you want to know what a godly teacher looks like? Dads, do you want to know what a godly dad looks like? They turn the grace of God into obedience through the work of the Holy Spirit, which then proves that Jesus Christ is in fact the master and Lord of their life. And I don't want to overlook the term master because master means absolute Ruler, You see, these ungodly people are, are looking or granting a license for immorality, but believers have an absolute ruler, Jesus Christ, who through his word gives us everything we need for a life of righteousness. So now that we can understand the character of the ungodly within the church. Let's quickly move through the mentality. I promise these points will be a little bit quicker, but it is imperative that we understand the gospel and the work of God in our lives to be able to differentiate false gospels that our culture teaches so let's move to the mentality. Verse five. Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving the people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. These are, there, there's, this is one of three mentalities or one of three examples or historical timestamps that Jude is providing for us to be able to depict what these ungodly characters look like. The first one is the mentality of the recusant. The recusant, a recusant person is one who refuses to submit to an authority or a regulation. The first example is the nation of Israel. We know the story. I taught it last week to the kids in the back. It's found in Exodus 1 through 14, which in our uh, reading plan this year, we should probably hit that next month, maybe. I believe it's next month. We should, we should hit it. But the Israelites were delivered from slavery in Egypt by God through his servant Moses. You know, after the 10 plagues, including the death of the firstborn and the Passover lamb, they're marching out of the land and they come to the Red Sea. And they think all hope is lost. The God who they just saw these miraculous signs taking place, right? Like frogs for days, Locusts for days, the slaughtering of the firstborn, and yet God delivered them. They get to the Red Sea, and this is what they say to Moses in Exodus 14. Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, Moses, saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? They wanted, they wished they were back in slavery. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. God doesn't leave them there. They walk through the Red Sea on dry ground. They turn around. They see the waves crash down on the enemy that is trying to annihilate them. And one chapter later, they are complaining in the desert that they have nothing to drink. They say, would that we have died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt and when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate the bread to full for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. They were mastered by their appetites. Their bellies dictated their faith in God. It doesn't stop there. God continually provides for them. 
they continue to complain even in Exodus 17. It's amazing because when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, the, the Lord Jesus even says, why do you worry about what you're going to eat or drink or what clothes you're going to put on? Look at the birds and look at the lilies. They're dressed in, 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 in a grandiose way even more than Solomon. How much more does your heavenly father love you? You see, they were unwilling to believe in the God who saved them to be the same God to sustain them. You see, this term subsequently that's used about Israel, it it has a connotation in Greek for the second time. You see, the first time God saved Israel out of slavery of Egypt physically, The second time, Jude says their judgment was sure because God destroyed those who did not believe. More can be said. Let's move on, though, to the mentality of the arrogant. These are the fallen angels. Verse 6, and angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bounds under darkness for the judgment of that great day. Let's first define arrogance. Arrogance is an attitude of superiority manifested in an overbearing manner or a presumptuous claim. You see, Jude gives a second example of fallen angels who in Genesis 6 came down to earth to procreate with the daughters of men. This example can be found in Genesis 6-2, and most commentators say this is what Jude is referring to. In verse 5, it's kind of interesting because Jude says, though you know all these things once for all. His audience knows all of these stories. I venture to guess most of us don't know this story. But in Genesis 6-2, it says this, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whoever they chose. You see, fallen angels, inclusive of Satan, still fall under the authority and rule of God. We see this directly in the book of Job, right? Satan joins with the sons of God before God the Father, and God says, have you considered my servant Job? There is none more righteous than him on the earth, and God has to grant him the the ability to go test Job's faith. And if you remember even more explicitly, God says you can do whatever you want, but don't kill him. You see, Satan still falls under the domain and rule of God, but these angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, they left their approved restraint. And the judgment on them by God is sure. They are being held since the flood, they are being held for judgment. Let's look at the third mentality the mentality of the deviant the mentality of the deviant. Jude gives us the example of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is pointing back to Abraham, similar to what his brother James did. If you don't know the story, God blessed Abraham and Lot immensely. They had to separate because their flocks were so big. Lot ends up by Sodom and Gomorrah, and God comes to Abraham and says, I am going to destroy these cities because they are wretched. Abraham, my vernacular, tries to negotiate with God, right? He says, hey, if there's 50 righteous, God, don't don't kill all of them. He negotiates down, and there's still not even 10 righteous in that city. You see, Jude's third example is of the demise and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. These deviant homosexual cities even devised a plan to rape the angels of God who are coming to save Lot. False prophets and these ungodly persons who creep into the church are deviant sexually. They seek after their own desires and disregard and depart from God's standard of sexual unity only found in his word and only to be between one man and one woman. This is not just seen with homosexuality, but with all forms of sexual promiscuity. 
Oftentimes, their own personal desires meld also into their teaching, and even more so, the Lord eventually brings many of these ministries to its knees, and we find out after the fact that there is a hidden undercurrent of deviance that gets revealed during the demise of these various ministries. We have all witnessed these in the past decades because they replace God's own word and the defined family structure. You see, these people are looking for a license to sin. And church, I want to be clear. These are not just theological nuances or disagreements. This is a false gospel with teachers whose judgments is eternal This warning matters. This is not one that we don't remember. I know even in this room, there are young students who are going to college. You are going to be on your own looking for a church on your own. Listen, you need to come grab somebody. You need to come grab an elder of the church. We would love to help you find a church, but it is imperative that you are in a church that teaches the true gospel because your soul is at risk if you are not in Jesus Christ. Our command in this little letter is to contend earnestly for the faith. You see, this perversion, this corruption of God's word is not a new problem. Satan is known as the great deceiver. And ever since Satan was cast out of heaven, he has made a mockery of God by deceiving the very people God created in his own image. You see, Satan's primary objective is to deceive the world into not having a a reconciled relationship with God, the very relationship that he lost tend to assume that Satan is after the ungodly, the unrighteous, and the downright evil in this world, yet the word of God describes Satan very differently. Very different, very different. You see, he, he, Satan is described this way. He is, he is described as the angel of light, because his very scheme is to disguise himself. Paul even says that Satan's minions in 2 Corinthians 11, he says that the servants of Satan are described as false prophets, deceitful workers who also disguise themselves as apostles of Christ and servants of righteousness. You see, the world will trample on the word of God for the sake of immorality, cheap grace, and an outright denial of Jesus Christ as Lord of their life. And this morning, we don't have time to talk about, well, what is the believer's response to this? But we're not just going to leave it here. I want to give you a little bit of insight and application. J.C. Ryle says it best. He says, what is the best safeguard against false teaching? Beyond all doubt, the regular study of the word of God with prayer for the teaching of the Holy Spirit. The Bible was given to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. The man who reads it aright will never be allowed greatly to err. It is neglect of the Bible which makes so many a prey to the first false teachers whom they hear. We need to be committed to regular study of God's word. That's one of the reasons Pastor Johnny continues to encourage you all to read through the Bible this year as a church. Much like someone who would be able to identify counterfeit bills, they spend so much time studying the real bill that they can point out a counterfeit the minute they see it. We need to be committed to God's word and regular active study in it so that when we hear counterfeit or we see counterfeit, we can identify it. You see, sound doctrine and obedient living is the evidence of a true teacher. Would you pray with me? Father God, Lord, we know that these warnings in Scripture are weighty. We understand, Father God, that these warnings from you are only to protect us.
Lord, may we recognize that because of your great love for us, even after the gift of salvation and the indwelling of the Spirit who, who manifests fruit in our lives, Lord, we, we continue to pray, even for Stonebridge, that you would protect it from any false teachers. Lord, you would protect it from ignorance. You would, um, Lord, challenge us for us to be committed to your word. And would we teach the entire counsel of it, no matter how different it is from our culture, without fear and without being afraid. I thank you, Lord, for those who are here. Would you protect them even this week, Father God? We love you and are grateful for the bond we have because of Jesus. And in his name we pray, amen. Thank you all. You are dismissed. We will see you next week. And don't forget about the membership class coming up in a couple weeks.